All right, let's talk a little bit about clouds since we've been talking about uh, evaporation and precipitation. In fact, the equilibrium vapor pressure that we just talked about has an influence on the formation of clouds. It should be somewhat intuitive to you at this point that if the water is, if the existing vapor pressure is greater than the equilibrium vapor pressure, supersaturated conditions, then water vapor is going to tend to fall out of solution, so to speak, or fall out of the air, so to speak, and form clouds. And that's exactly what happens. Water vapor um, on the surface of the land or ocean may condense directly. Where there's a surface, such as a tree or your car, water vapor can condense directly from the atmosphere onto your car or onto leaves of grass or a surface or something like that. But up in the air, there's really nothing, i put that in quotes, for that water vapor to condense upon. Well, as it turns out, there is something for it to condense upon. Tiny little particles of dust and liquid droplets called aerosols form the nucleus of clouds, and we call those cloud condensation nuclei. These tiny particles, which are only from 1 one hundredths to 10 micrometers in diameter, and they're both liquid and solid, these tiny particles act as nuclei around which water vapor can condense. This turns out to be the first step in cloud formation. So you may never have thought about clouds as being tiny particles of dust or little liquids, but in fact they are. And they represent areas where water vapor is condensed around a little particle as a result of these cloud condensation nuclei. And if, and if you're kind of old like I am, you remember early efforts um, at cloud seeding. In fact, some of them still go on. The Chinese experimented with cloud seeding during the recent Summer Olympics, the 2008 Summer Olympics, as a way of stimulating cloud production and stimulating ultimately rain. This is sort of the basis of that, that to make clouds and ultimately to make rain, you have to have some kind of particles around which those that water can condense. Well, as it turns out, one important class of these cloud condensation nuclei, or CCN, are something called aerosols. These are tiny little particles, liquid or solid, that are actually have biological origins. And this is a very fascinating, albeit perhaps controversial, hypothesis. Certain organisms, in particular the coccolithophorids, if you remember, I ask you to remember that word and tell it to your friends, coccolithophorids, you'll be a uh, looked upon as a very intelligent person, if you can say that word, coccolithophorid. Coccolithophorids release a group of chemicals called dimethyl sulfides, and dimethyl sulf sulfides turn out to be a very potent cloud condensation nuclei. It's actually been hypothesized by James Lovelock and, and others now. James Lovelock, the sort of founder of the Gaia hypothesis and the controversial hypothesis in the 1970s that the Earth is alive, uh, is a living organism, um, proposes, first of all, and it goes something like this, but let me get to this graph first. Here, this gives you some idea of the different sizes of raindrops and cloud droplets and the cloud condensation nuclei. So you can see these are very tiny. Here's when water forms around the cloud condensation nuclei and ultimately the kinds of raindrops that keep falling on your head when you're out in the rain without an umbrella. Figure 8-8 eight, eight in the book. All right, here's the picture I wanted to get to. These are the aforementioned coccolithophorids. They produce dimethyl sulfides, which are cloud condensation nuclei, an aerosol. As they do so, when there's lots of sunlight and as these organisms bloom and reproduce and produce these dimethyl sulfides and release them to the atmosphere, they lead to formation of clouds. And this has actually been shown in tropical rainforests now. It's actually even been shown in the Great Barrier Reef that the release of dimethyl sulfides by organisms can cause cloud formation. The question really is, does it have global implications and it is, it, does it really affect weather regionally? Does it, um, in fact, cause significant changes? And you can think of some reasons why organisms might want to produce clouds, particularly rainforests or uh, places that don't get a lot of rain. If they can produce their own rain or at least stimulate rain, well, then they have more water. 
Why that might want to be true in a place like a coral reef? Well, perhaps it's a way of shading. Who knows? Uh, an adaptation um, to prevent the corals from being bleached out. Don't know the answer to that one, but it's a possibility. In any case, when they produce these cloud condensation nuclei, we get clouds and sometimes we get rain. Of course, when we get clouds, then we get less sunlight. And when we get less sunlight, what happens to the cockle of the forids? They grow more slowly. And if the cockle of the forids grow more slowly, then they produce less dimethyl sulfides. And then we have less cloud condensation nuclei. And we have fewer clouds. And then we have more sunlight. And when we have more sunlight, what happens to the cockle of the forids? That's right, they start to grow again and produce more dimethyl sulfides and more CCN, then we have more clouds. This is an example of a negative feedback in that the cockle of the forwards are regulating cloud formation and thereby regulating their rates of growth. So when they're growing quickly, more clouds are formed. When they're growing slowly, less clouds are formed and so on and so forth. And again, this is a hotly debated topic, the degree to which organisms may influence atmospheric processes such as cloud formation, but it's certainly an intriguing one and one that scientists are going to look into uh, a bit more in the coming decades.